Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Gerard Nighorn. I'm with Lenzyme Inc. And today I'm going to be talking about Greece, everybody's problem out there from what I hear. So um, I've been in the industry now for about 25 years. Uh, prior to this, I actually was a plant manager. And that's really where I learned a lot about wastewater. Um, one of the things that uh, they handed to me as a plant manager was, here's the wastewater treatment plant. It's all yours, figure it out. So I learned a lot from that. Um, then I went on uh, into uh, buying into Lenzyme Inc. And um, you know, been doing that for the last 25 years. So you guys all thought you were here for Greece today, right? Well, you're gonna get greased. Welcome to your timeshare meeting. What do you think these round table sessions are gonna be for, okay? We're going to get you all signed up. I want the one with the cruise. Oh, the, one with the, the one with the cruise, OK. All right, we have to put this on. Um, I've been speaking for a long time at various shows. And typically, they ask us to put this slide up to please silence your cell phones. And I got a little funny story about that. My second year into speaking, um, I was at a pretty big show. Nervous as could be, put the slide up, started into the show, got about 10 minutes into it, and of all things, I was the one that got the phone call. And it was my daughter, of all people. It wasn't even work-related. And it was like, what are you doing, Jess, calling me in the middle of the day? So I was pretty embarrassed. So yeah, I put this uh, always on my uh, slides now. I'd like to give a big uh, thank you to everybody. I'm not used to talking with a mic. Usually I walk around. But I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to everybody that's here attending. Um, from all of you, this is really where I've learned in the last 25 years. So typically, I take this information. I go and do some research on it uh, from the things that I've learned from you. And then I put it into some type of an agenda or speaking form. And that allows me to come out here and share it with more people. Um, over the years, though, I've learned an awful lot. So I appreciate all of the knowledge that's in this room. I'd also like to thank the uh, MSTA staff. Uh, they put a heck of a show together. This is my first time here. It's a beautiful place. And uh, I don't think you guys could ask for a better association. Fog, fats, oils, and grease. So what most people would consider big problems, and I think it's becoming even a bigger problem as we go along. Um, as you can see here, we're just showing a, a pipe here that's clogged with grease. We've got an in-floor grease trap. Um, and I'm sure that you guys have seen plenty of this. And I'm sure you've dealt with the, the problems of trying to get rid of uh, the oils. And I'm sure you've dealt with the problems with all the smells when you're dealing with the restaurants. It's a major problem. But for some, Greece is a pretty big opportunity. And this is one place, uh, you know, you have an opportunity here in your businesses. You've already owned equipment. So you have some opportunities here to side shift and possibly change your business or add to your business and make more money through Greece. Rendering plants, is there anybody here that deals with a rendering plant or anybody that is associated with any rendering plants? Nobody, huh? Well, I can tell you all about rendering plants because that's where I was the plant manager, okay? So for 16 years, I spent uh, my time at a rendering plant. And I'm just gonna share a little story with you real quick. We, um, we were a pretty big plant um, nationwide and we always had nibblers. And what I mean by nibblers is people used to follow our trucks, find out where we were going, and then they would start nibbling on us for business. Well, we had a couple of guys that were doing that. Some just fell off the bandwagon, never made it. But we had one really sharp guy, and he was a dump truck driver. That's what he was. He took his truck and converted it, and he changed it into picking up brown and yellow grease. So he turned it into a barrel truck, basically. 
And all he did was follow us, and by the next week, it was his account, not, no longer our account. So he was a nibbler. What did we end up doing? We bought him out, and we paid dearly to do that. So when I talk about rendering plants, I don't mean give up your septic business. I'm talking about eh, maybe side shift a little bit, learn how to make money off of it. You're already going to you know, get paid from the customer to take the grease. Why not take it now and bring it someplace and sell it rather than trying to get rid of it at the wastewater treatment plants? So there's opportunity there, okay? And I just, I know firsthand because I live through it. So, um, grease trap pumpers, you know, if you're just into grease yourself, I mean, that's a big business. The problem comes down to, and we're going to talk about that a little later, is getting rid of it. It's a tough thing to get rid of. And I know now in certain states that you can mix grease in with your loads, but at only a certain percentages. Um, if you try to bring a full load of grease you know, directly to the, to the municipality, you're probably going to get turned away. They're also going to probably start making you test it. So that's another thing they're going to do. Rooter companies, big business for rooter companies. Obviously, you can go in and jet it. Um, so there's big money in cleaning out, you know, especially restaurants. And it seems like restaurants, that's where the biggest problems are. This is a pretty general slide. I think everybody's going to know all of this stuff, but I'm just going to run through it real, real quick. The characteristics of grease. So it usually collects on the sidewalls and it builds itself inward. And I want to mention one thing about that because it's the guys that do the cleaning out there. If you're not jetting the line, jetting usually will clean the entire line out. But if you're just running a, uh, like a snake through it, all you're doing is poking a hole through the center of it. And it's going to coagulate and close back up pretty quickly. So jetting is obviously the best thing you can do. The viscosity is thick and it changes with heat. Uh, normal color is a, a, a kind of a brown goldish color. But depending upon what grease mix, mixes with, it can actually change its color. So when you open up a septic tank and you're looking inside of it, don't think that you know, that's something else. It might be grease, but it might be chemically changed because of the way it mixed with something else. Uh, grease is comprised of three fatty acids. Grease comes, with, uh, comes from animal fat and vegetable matter. It tends to repel water, I think we all know that, and it sticks to almost anything. And we know that just obviously when you're trying to clean your trucks out and all your lines out, it's a mess. Many of the problems are caused by grease. So 40 to 50% of all sewer overflows come from grease. And all, almost all commercial kitchens out there when they have a problem, it's typically because they're backing up with grease. I'll just go into that real quickly uh, about the commercial backups. We did some testing on, on the backups. And on a three compartment sink, if you do nothing and you just let your, you know, typically it's ran by young people in the back kitchen area. If they're just rinsing the dishes off, our test came out for two years in a row, almost like clockwork, Every five weeks, that sink will back up. It will actually back up from the, the uh, in-floor grease trap back into your uh, three-compartment sink. Now, we are able to solve that with some of the things that I do. But I just want everybody to know that's what happens with the grease. It's going to do it, period. It interferes with wastewater treatment facilities, and it causes a lot of backups in septic fields. Matter of fact, grease is number three on the list of problems with septic fields. There are six major reasons that septic systems have problems. Um, now, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons, okay, but these are the major reasons. This is normally what it, it will fall into for a category. So biomat, biomat is number one. Sodium binding, that's what a clay field, that's where you're going to get uh, crystallization built up. And then grease capping and organics. And when you mix the two together, you got, you got major problems. Uh -huh. Root intrusion, field damage, 
and then man-made problems. So those are the six things that typically cause the problems out in the field. And again, grease being a major problem because it can mix with any of these. And uh, it's hard to get rid of, especially once it's down into the stone bed or into the sand bed. And Aristotle, just a little comment here. For the things we have to learn before we can do them, we learn by doing them. How many times, you know, have you gone out and, and uh, you look at something and you go, well, let's have at it. And that's how you're going to learn to do it. So even with grease, it's the same thing. Um, you know, you go to fix a job, you're looking at something, you're not quite sure what it is. You're going to learn by doing it. So what is a grease molecule? A grease molecule is made up of, like we said, it's uh, three fatty assets. Um, and it's the glycerol. So that's, they're formed in three, and, and um, there's some examples here of palmitic acid, stearic acid, um, oleic acid. And then we have different forms of oil or different forms of grease. We have saturated fats like butter, beef tallow, there's the rendering plant. And we have solid fats, lard. Um, unsaturated fats, we've got cooking oils, such as like olive, corn, or peanut. And they stay in a liquid form. So where does grease come from? And I'm not talking about you know, grease where it, where it actually is um, formed. I'm not talking about like the animal fats and the, the plant matter. I'm talking about what happens down the line when you start using grease and oils. Well, common sense says that you know, people are just pouring this cooking grease down the drains, right? That's what most, you know, most, we would all think that in our industry. Processed foods are packed with oils. This all started about 1960 when we started getting all the processed foods. And then we get into the highly processed foods and they're even worse. Those are the ones that are packed with oils and with sugars. So keep that in mind as we're going forward here about processed foods. Then there are some foods that are just heavy in fats, like bacon, for an example. And for those of you that are uh, game people out there and you've uh, eaten duck before, so duck is very, very fatty and very oily. So a lot of the different foods are, are causing some of the problems that uh, we are starting to see in the septic systems. And here's a word I'm going to ask, just don't shout it out if you know, but does anybody know what this is? Steeria. Anyone? Okay, well, it's a, it's a, you're going to learn something then today. I'm glad that I, I brought this in. But this is something that most people will never talk about. This is something that at the dinner table will never be brought up, okay? And this is all about people that have problems with like IBS, Crohn's disease, colitis, all those different problems. And it happens right here on the throne. A lot of people don't realize how much grease passes through their body and goes to the septic system. So how many people can, you know, when you go out on a job site and you brought them out to the tank and you show them and you say, look at this. And they go, we never put grease down our system, right? I'm sure you guys all heard that before. Well, the fact might be that they fall into this category right here. And that falls back into the processed foods. Since the 1960s, a lot of the processed foods have a lot of oil and sugar in them. How many times have you walked away from the dinner table and you, know, you kind of feel your, your stomach and you go, ah, oh, that, that just didn't sit very good. And you know, 30 minutes later, you know where you are. You're sitting on this throne right here, right? Well, that's part of the problem in today's septic. We're introducing a lot of grease into the septic system because of the foods that we actually eat. So, you know, when somebody comes out there and you show them that, now you'll have a little more understanding that, hey, maybe, who knows, maybe they're, they're having problems with their digestive system. 
you know, maybe they do have Crohn's um, or something, something else. Um, I can tell you this much, there's certain foods I know I can't eat. And I learned the hard way. You know, I ended up on the throne 30 minutes later. But the bottom line is there's a lot of grease in processed foods. And that all started again back in the 1960s. And in today's world, it's amazing how much processed food we actually do eat. So how does grease break down? Well, most people think that by, in the general public anyway, they think by rinsing it off with hot water just magically takes it away. So what really happens though, it puts it into emulsion. And emulsion is a state of taking two mixtures, putting them together for a short period of time, and then they break apart again. And that's what emulsion really does. It suspends something. And you can see down here the definition of emulsion. Emulsion is dispersion, droplets of one liquid suspended in another immiscible liquid. Uh, or a mixture of two liquids that would normally would not mix together. So some type of a emulsifier will turn grease into magically disappearing. Now the millennials might not remember this, but people my age, they should remember this. Does everybody remember the, the um, advertisement? It was pasted on our TVs for years back in the 70s when they took the magical Dawn dish soap and they dropped it into the water and all of a sudden all the dirty water just moved over to the sides and it kind of disappeared? Well, that's an emulsifier and that's exactly what it did. Um, it took the grease, emulsified it, and made it became, become water soluble but only for a short period of time. And basically here's what I'm talking about. When you have an emulsifier, once it cools off, the water cools off, or the emulsifier actually wears out, that grease comes back out of that water. And now it's gonna coagulate somewhere down the line. So that's really what emulsifiers do. The best way to attack, or uh, ways to attack grease are with surfactants solvents, and enzymes. But we're going to take a closer look at each one of these. Um, and I should mention um, the, that the molecule of grease, they're, they're all separate molecules. That's how grease is formed. So as they cool off, those molecules actually attach to each other. Okay? It's going to be important because when I get further down the line here on my slides. Surfactants. So how did that Dawn dish soap actually do its job? Well, there's hydrophilic and hydrophobic in every um, soap micelli. They call it micelli. That's the, fan that's the fancy scientific name for it, okay? So if you look at this little cluster on the screen here, you can actually see that the hydrophobic end and the hydrophilic end and how it works. Hydrophobic meaning that it's got a phobia. It wants to stay above water. It doesn't want to drown, right? Just like a human being would. And then you got the other part that says, oh, I love being in water. So it mixes down into the water. Well, when you end up putting in grease with this mixture, the grease clings on immediately because it doesn't want to drown, okay? But the soap is actually making it uh, become emulsified. So this is it in action. When you look at inside of this beaker here, you can actually see all the little bubbles of soap forming there. And you can see the color, of the, the, the goldish color, that's actual grease. And it's, it's just attracted like a magnet. And it goes right to the surfactant and it clings onto it. And you can see by the drawing where we show how the oil on the surface, which now is on the surface of the water, it clings on to the micelli, the micelli lifts it up in the air and magically takes it and disperses it into the water. And then you end up with clusters like you see on the bubble inside the beaker. Now, of course, this is all done in a lab, okay? But this is what's happening in the drains, septic fields, in the wastewater treatment plants. This happens all the way down the line. 
So when the surfactants wear off, what happens? You can just see it right here. The grease, the bubbles are starting to break. They're starting to let go. Where did those molecules all go? They went right to the sidewalls. And they clinged onto the sidewalls, and they're starting to coagulate. Obviously, that's a pretty sticky problem. Let's talk about solvents real quick. Now, solvents work in a different way. So they're organic compounds, and what they do is they change the grease, and they make it like coagulate together and bunch together. Now, solvents work like a, a nonpolar uh, molecules that dissolve nonpolar substances. It's a fancy way of saying that we're going to take clusters and put them together. That's how it works. The problem with solvents is that, obviously, they're not environmentally friendly. Okay, so we don't want people dumping solvents down their drains. They also kill off all the beneficial bacteria in your septic system. So that's bad news. Solvents are found a lot of times in, you can see here, I written, wrote those things down, um, in the uh, paint, um, turpentines, uh, dry and cleaning fluids. That's why when people say, or you see that people are pouring paint down their drain, you need to educate them not to do that because they, there's a lot of solvents in paint. So that's a bad deal all the way around, especially if it's going down in the septics. This is the restaurant owner that just found out that one of his employees poured down a gallon of solvent down in his drains. Probably gonna ruin his commercial drain field. A gallon of it probably would do it too. So they're not environmentally friendly. They create problems with the wastewater treatment plants. They kill off the bacteria. Another thing that people don't realize is that they have a very long lasting detrimental effect. They're very hard for, to wear off and get rid of. And again, they're not safe for the environment. Um, obviously, we're all here, our industry, we're trying to clean the water before it gets down to the water table. And solvents are going to get through, and they're going to get into the drinking water. Another way of doing it is enzymes and bacteria. So enzymes are all uh, proteins. An example would be lipase, which is a specific enzyme to break down grease. So all the different enzymes out there are specific. So if you have uh, proteins, you want protease. You have toilet paper, you want cellulase. So there's multitudes of different enzymes. All bacteria need an enzyme to break its food source down before it can actually consume it. So that's another important thing to realize out there. Um, at, enzymes work like catalyst. And the best way to explain an enzyme and the way they work is as soon as they become in 20% water, um, they start attacking whatever that food source is. They work kind of like a flashlight and how a battery is in a flashlight. So if you're clicking a flashlight on and off, on and off, it's going to be really strong for the first couple hours, and then it's going to slowly start dying off. Well, that's exactly what happens to enzymes. They do the exact same thing. But they attack really fast. So the example for grease would be the lipase enzyme. And having the specific bacteria in your septic system that can actually recognize the grease as a food source and produce the lipase enzyme is also important. Now, in wastewater treatment plants, they're using, they use tons and tons of uh, bacteria and enzymes because they have to break down things quickly. So enzymes wear out. Once they, once they break their food source down, though, what happens is the bacteria start consuming that food. Once they start consuming that food, they realize that this is what I need to start producing because this is the majority of the food in, my, in this tank right now. So if they realize that it's a lot of grease, they actually start producing a lot more lipase enzymes. How does an enzyme work? Most people don't realize how this works and how it works with grease. So grease is a specific molecule, and I'm just going to use my hand to show you this. 
So if my hand shape is like this, and this is a grease molecule, and it's floating down through the water system, what happens is that the opposite specific enzyme lipase right here floats by, and what they do is they attract and they actually attach to each other. Once they attach, they don't let go, okay? They actually break down the uh, grease molecule into its smallest chain. Remember the chains we talked about before? The three fatty acids? That's exactly what the enzyme will do. It will break it down. Now here's the best part about the enzymes, and wastewater treatment plants do this all the time. You break it down, it never coagulates, and it never goes back to its original form. It's broken down into its smallest chain right now, which allows the bacteria now to come behind it and eat it, okay? So the bacteria is the living, you know, is the living microorganism. And the, the catalyst to break its food down is actually the enzyme. So you never actually get coagulation. So I've heard people, and I guess I always want to clear this up with people, I've heard people say that, you know, no, you're just emulsifying it and sending it down the line. No, what I'm doing is, with an enzyme, is breaking it down into its smallest chain so it doesn't coagulate anywhere down the line. And we're allowing the bacteria to consume it. Now, you're never going to see this with your naked eye. Um, like I always tell people that are treating grease traps, you can treat a grease trap that's hard as a rock, clean it out, get it clean, start treating it, and that grease will never be hard in that grease trap again. It will stay like applesauce in there. Your bacteria that are forming in that grease trap are eating about 20% of the grease. It just doesn't have enough time because grease traps have to act very quickly. And quite frankly, we don't design grease traps properly with enough um, you know, settling, uh, settling time and size-wise. Um, and I think that probably comes down to just to the cost of doing it. So when you're treating with enzymes, you are actually destroying that molecule and not allowing it to come back together. So you won't get coagulation. Another good analogy is you can see the key up here. Specific enzymes. Put the key in the lock. That's an enzyme. And that's a grease molecule. If I can unlock the lock, that was the specific enzyme that unlocked it. And it's not going to lock again. So enzymes break down the grease um, molecule apart and they stay apart. And this is showing it right here. You can see the grease before. It's all coagulated in the middle. As soon as we hit it with enzymes, you can see what happens to it. It disperses it out. It's breaking those molecules apart. Don't be afraid of grease because it can be profitable. And here's the top five ways to make grease profitable. Obviously, high pressure jetting pipelines full of grease. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are, how many guys in here actually are into jetting besides your septic pumping? Quite a few. It's a great business. Um, yeah, it's probably a little pricey to get into. You can start out small though. I know a lot of guys have some, you know, good cameras here at the show and, you know, there's a lot of good uh, equipment makers for the jetters, but it is a very profitable business. And then uh, you can get into the uh, restaurants, residential homes, commercial properties, municipalities. As you can see here, I got to pull a long jetter here. Those get a little pricey. Start out small, you can make out some decent money on it. You can actually carry it on your truck even. Collect and sell yellow grease, just like I talked about before. If you've got the trucks already and you have an opportunity to convert your truck, maybe you have a roll off unit and you can control, uh, convert it over to a bed where you can haul barrels, why not? It's a good side business. You don't have to worry about getting rid of the grease. So, and I know that getting rid of grease right now is very, very, very tough. Matter of fact, um, I don't know in Michigan, but uh, our landfills here, or not landfills, are the municipalities still taking grease for the most part or not? Anybody? What's that? Very few. Very few. Another option for that then is to maybe get together with a couple of guys and do a dewatering system 
So you can take the grease and bring it to the landfill. Another option there. So there's different options, though, to make money um, off of grease rather than paying to get rid of it. I can tell you this much. In New York, they can't get rid of grease. They have to drive across the state line to get rid of it. So, you know, pumping grease traps there, you get two or three grease traps done in one day because you got to drive for the next two hours to get rid of it and then two hours back. Trap and fry, uh, fry our grease. It's recyclable. So if you look at this, um, this uh, slide, you got 20% makes up the uh, candles, food grade lubricants. 20% goes into cattle feed, dog and cat food. And then 60% goes into poultry feed and pork feed. These numbers are probably a little skewed. Um, I know back in the rendering business, uh, when we were doing a lot of the grease, we were making tallow. Um, that tallow actually went into a lot of the makeup products. I hate to tell you that, women, but that's what it went into. So, you know, there's a, there was a big, it was a big profit center for us. Um, and we shipped a lot of that overseas. But this is the, a pretty good breakdown of where it actually goes into. Cleaning out pump station floats and sidewalls. I mean, if you go in there and you're, you're going to just do this as a business. And I, I'll tell you what, you can probably make a lot of money because I can't tell you how many calls I've got over the years about floats always being stuck, you know, in these pump chambers. Pumping grease traps. You know, I'm sure some of you, that might be your only business. Um, again, though, it's getting tougher to get rid of it. And if you're going to do that, add a treatment to it. I can tell you this from experience. Once you clean a grease trap out and you have the people treating it properly, it's going to stay like applesauce. So it'll be very easy to clean out the next time. Here's some stats. 40% of the household on septic systems, up to 25% of septic systems are failing. 90% of all septic failures are in the drain field. And grease capping uh, is one of those top five reasons. And actually grease capping is one of the, it is a major reason out there. I have a lot of guys calling me on that. Uh, you know, the best things you can do um, is get into jetting, jetting the field lines out. Uh, obviously, if you own such, some type of a quacking machine to go in there and blow air into the field, break it apart. You can also do treatments on it. Um, that's where we come in. Um, otherwise, it's replacement. That's what it comes down to. So this talks about grease capping. We're just showing you right here. They're jetting the lines out. Remember, though, when you jet lines out, you're not jetting the field. You're only jetting the line. Now, the perforated holes, yes, you're shooting some into those little holes, and you are hitting some little pieces of the gravel field. But the problem actually lies in the sand and in the gravel. And that's where the grease capping is taking place. That's where the biomat builds up too. So once you get grease capping, what's the next thing that's going to happen? You're going to get biomat because now you're not taking any water and biomat is formed by not taking any water into the field. So what are the problems at the wastewater treatment plants? Well, this is where they introduce uh, bioaugmentation. And the biggest problems um, in bioaugmentation, let me just hit that real quick. That's a fancy name just for saying that we're going to add tons and tons of oxygen, a lot of air to the system. And the reason you do that is that you speed up the metabolism of the bacteria. That's what you're doing. And when you do that, bacteria can consume at about 20% faster than what they would normally consume without the oxygen. And that's right here, the process of introducing bacteria and enzymes in mass amounts of air. That's really what it is. And then what you're doing is you're going to add the enzymes to help break that food source down. So once you add that massive amount of air, you, you sp uh, sped up the metabolism rate of the bacteria. Now they can start consuming their food source. Screens and skimmers take the biggest beating at the metropolitan sewage plants. Now, remembering back to the, my day when I was in charge of the um, our wastewater treatment plant, we had skimmers. And 
I swear to God, we were probably, you know, draining that skimmer probably every three to five days and scraping it. All because we just couldn't keep the grease buildup off of them. So we learned over the years too, once we became better educated on using the enzyme products, we started using those and we were able to attack this problem. The same thing happens with the screens. Problem with the screens is though that the grease gets on them, but then all the other organic material sticks to it. So you end up you know, shutting your plant down just so you can go out there. And a lot of times you have to hand pick a lot of the stuff off or you have to sit and pressure jet it all off. And that takes hours and it's a big cost you know, to all these uh, uh, metropolitan sewage plants. So what's the best practices? Stop it at the source. If you can talk to anybody at the metropolitan sewer plants, that's what they're gonna tell you. Bring it all the way back to where is the source, where is this happening? And it's either gonna be a restaurant, you know, not scraping their dishes off properly, um, or it's gonna be a homeowner, uh, you need to educate these people. And I, you know, as much as I hate to say this, you guys are the first line of defense. I mean, really talking to the homeowners and talking to these restaurant owners, you can educate them a little bit on what problems this really is causing. And in the meantime, I'm sure it's gonna be painful in their pocketbook when you tell them that, you know, hey, all your, your main lines going underneath your concrete floor are plugged. We're going to have to come in here, you know, and shut you down for X amount of hours to clean this. You learn real quick when it's money coming out of your pocket. But at least give them an education on this. So talking about systems, ATUs. And ATUs use a lot of air. That's really how they're designed. ATUs come in all different sizes, shapes, everything. I've seen them all. Um, I probably haven't seen them all, but... I've seen a, a, a fair amount of them. But really what they're doing is you're introducing oxygen into the system so you can break down the organics quickly and more specifically to break down the grease and have it consumed by the bacteria. That's what you're doing in an ATU. Typically ATUs, you probably all know this, are put in because usually you don't have enough land area to put um, a regular septic field in. So the ATU is doing a lot of the treatment prior, and it can go into a shorter field uh, or a smaller footprint, if you want to call it that. But that's, ATUs really are, you know, miniature wastewater treatment plants. That's all they are. And they're using air, introducing air, and, and uh, increasing that metabolic rate. How many people deal with ATUs in, in here? We have a handful of people, okay. Um, I know like in Ohio, Texas, places like that, um, out east, that's really all they have. A lot of ATUs typically cost about 40 grand to put in. And, you know, if the homeowners aren't educated properly on how to use them, they are a nightmare. So um, both for the homeowner and for the you know, person having to maintain them. So just cleaning them out is uh, a process. Next best practice, obviously, is to educate the, uh, the customer. Dewater it. If you can get into dewatering, I've seen many of these systems down at the uh, you know, various shows. Um, dewatering, I think, is actually a, a, I think it has some promise you know, to uh, probably a less expensive way of getting rid of grease. And then, uh, you know, treated at the source, obviously, let's go back to the source again and let's get it treated. Don't be afraid of grease. Um, look at grease as an opportunity. It really is. Now, I only had about 40 minutes to go through this, so you can't really talk about everything. But, uh, you know, I'm going to take a little more time at the round table and we'll be able to discuss some things. I also am going to be talking a little bit about the wipes situation. I've got some pretty good information on that. And then, um, you know, hope to see you guys in the future. And uh, thank you for uh, letting me speak today. Appreciate it. One last thing. Are there any questions? And if there are, anybody have any questions?
still seems like there's in the moment it's still manages to get the drink bills drinking but we're gonna like basically just sink it so we get it with the trucks instead of like and um or Well there is there is in wastewater treatment plants. Um, but I don't know that it, I don't know that you'd want to use it because it is more of on the solvent chemical side. Um, so to answer that question, obviously the people that know me, um, I own Lenzyme. Okay, so I deal with bacteria and enzymes, and I'm going to tell you flat out that I could treat your drain field and probably keep it working just with the bacteria and enzymes. So yes, you could do it. Mm -hmm. I understand. We got two commercial grade filters installed and several compartments, but it's still in the last tank. It'll get kind of, it still finds its way, you know. So, can you treat that with? You can, product? yes. You would treat the last chamber, is what you would do. Okay. Yes. How much would it take? To do oh, it, we'd have to go through those numbers. Okay. Yeah. But another thing, I'll, and I mentioned it when I was talking before, most systems are undersized. And really, that's probably what his main problem is. He's undersized. It doesn't have enough time to cool off. So, and if you're gonna size something properly, you could be talking more multiple tanks. So that's another thing to look at, just from an engineering. Correct, correct, yep. Yep, then you can skim off. So that makes the most sense, but it's also the most expensive, <laughs> so. Any more questions? All right. Well, I appreciate everybody. Hopefully, we'll see you at the roundtables.